Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome all our chamber members and all our internet followers. Uh, if this is your first time participating in a convener meeting of the Surprise Regional Chamber of Commerce, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, the purpose of these conversations is to connect business owners, community leaders, and stakeholders with current issues, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, my name is Raul Sada. I'm the president and CEO for the Surprise Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, America has the most advanced healthcare systems uh, in the world, and in large part due to the private and not-for-profit sector-led innovation and employer-sponsored healthcare coverage. Uh, while the West Valley benefits tremendously from ongoing advancements in uh, bioscience, technology, and care, uh, we uh, continue to wrestle with the challenge of making health uh, quality health care more affordable, uh, more accessible, and more reliable. And our Chamber of Commerce uh, promotes effective private and not-for-profit sector solutions to our health care challenges. So today we have a very impressive lineup of two West Valley icons. Uh, we have Sharon Lynn, CEO of Banner Del Webb Medical Center and Banner Boswell Medical Center. Our second distinguished guest is Joe LaRue, president and CEO of Sun Health. And today's moderator is Chris Herring. Uh, Chris Herring uh, serves on the Chamber's Government Relations uh, Committee and, and is the chairperson of that committee. Uh, and when Chris is not volunteering for the chamber, he's the director of strategy and operations for product management for Phoenix University. So with that, Chris, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Raul. And uh, thank you, Joe and Sharon, for being here this morning. Well, we are going to get uh, right into the meat of, of uh, our conversation this morning. Healthcare has been thought about, I think, more in the last 20, 20 months, 18 months, by the average uh, American and, and I think the average global citizen, um, probably than, than any other point in my lifetime. Uh, it, it's been something that we've all had to consider to think about. Um, I, I think in my family, it's probably not unique to other families. We've had the what if scenarios here. What, what, what would we do if the following happened? Um, you know, the pandemic has been uh, unlike anything else uh, most of us have experienced, at least in the United States. And so healthcare has changed, um, just as, as I think many industries have changed, healthcare has changed dramatically in, in the last year to year and a half. Uh, so glad that you're here and you're able to talk about that. We do want to talk a bit about the future this morning um, and, and focus on that. And, uh, and hopefully we've, we've all learned a lot from the pandemic and, and, uh, and, and are able to make some great changes. Um, we hope this doesn't happen again. Uh, we hope that uh, that pandemics are 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 rare and uh, and you know once in a century type things, um, but in the event that it that it that it did that we were better prepared. So, Joe and Sharon, thank you for being here. Um, uh, I'm going to get right into the questions. Normally we give some open remarks, but uh, we we have some technical difficulties, and so due to time, we're we're going to get right into questions. So, Sharon, I'll start with you. We've learned a lot. We've changed a lot in healthcare. But in the Northwest Valley, what still needs to change? What should we be focused on to improve healthcare in the Northwest Valley? Yeah, good morning, Chris, and thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and participate with uh, Joe LaRue with Sun Health, a great partner to us. Uh, so I'm honored to be here. You know, I, I would share with you um, just as we, as we see healthcare today, um, as we reflect on a couple of things, you know, the past 20 months, uh, two years. Um, while the pandemic has created some of the most disruption in healthcare that many of us um, will, will only see once in our lifetime, um, and, and it's touched, that disruption has touched many other businesses as well uh, from a, a workflow perspective and workforce. But um, the disruption we've experienced, um, we are attempting at Banner Health to leverage all the learnings that have come over the last 20, 24 months uh, to say how we, how we have been able to um, make advancements in medicine and the de delivery of care and some of our work streams around not just the acute side, but in the ambulatory setting as our community focused on you know, access to care and thinking about where, where do I best approach, right? Given, given where me and my family are in our healthcare journey, where do I best access care? How do we create that safe place for care? There's been a lot of discussion uh, around how do we create safe place for care? 
and promoting um, the health and well being, not delaying or deferring care. And so as we think about the advancements that have been made, our ability to leverage technology and telehealth, tele telemedicine, e-visits, reaching the consumer outside of coming into a clinic or ED um, or a hospital, that we've reached the consumer in a different way. And some of those technology advancements, Chris, it would have taken us, you know, the next three, five, 10 years uh, to leverage that. And so we've we've done it internally. We've partnered with some with some other um, tech vendors to really accelerate that. And the consumer's looking for that experience. Um, that spans across many ages, many demographics and generations, but they're looking for that experience. How do they access care? How do we keep it affordable and cost? Uh, it needs to be efficient and quality. That's what they're looking for. So as we watch the Northwest Valley, the West Valley grow, how do we really um, transform our, our integrated delivery model to leverage that? And as we're supporting our senior care and independent living, some of those communities uh, that Joe is involved in, um, how do we support some of the younger families that are moving to the community? How do we support some of our business partners in engaging them in occupational health and that well being of their workforce? How do we get, if folks are injured, how do we get them back to work and, and fully functioning? How do we keep kids well and young and healthy, preventive health? screenings. Um, Chris, I'll add, you know, years ago, we used to um, approach consumers and get to know them and their families once they became sick, right? So a lot of focus around health and well-being, preventive uh, health measures. How do we manage chronic disease differently? So we keep them uh, out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, which is high cost. Um, how do we keep care closer to home? How do we create those, create those points of access that are, that are affordable and convenient? Um, because as, as, as much as we can do that local, that helps influence the health and well-being of our community and supports our local businesses as well. And the schools and, and keeping these kids in school healthy where they're able to learn and, and flourish. Um, that's really our goal. We wanna be that partner in influence, influencing um, superior care here in the Northwest Valley and how we, how we do that as a business partner. Thank you. And Joe, you know, we, Sharon mentioned it, you know, as, as we talk about uh, the Northwest Valley and priorities, um, the demographics have shifted younger. The, 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 the largest area of growth has been in young families. Uh, but even with that, we continue to see um, the geriatric community grow. We have new age protected communities going up. Downtown Surprise has a new uh, large, you know, large facility going in that's age protected. Um, there's plans for more off of the 303. So we will continue to see growth in the older uh, demographic as well. Um, what, what, what needs to change for us to service the growth uh, in the Northwest Valley? Yeah, you know, thank you, Chris, and I'm uh, very appreciative to be uh, invited this morning. Uh, you know, as, as I would start and say that um, uh, it's all about collaboration, it's all about connection, and that's, that's the role of the, you know, the Surprise Chamber, right, is, is being that connector. And so thank you for this, this uh, opportunity. And, and uh, Banner, you know, with uh, Banner Health and Sharon Lynn, they're one of our uh, greatest collaborative um, forces we have in the Northwest Valley. And so I couldn't be more pleased to be here with Sharon. And, and kind of picking up on, um, well, well, Chris, your question about there will be a lot more age-related facilities. I mean, that's a given. If you just look at the aging of the globe and the aging of America and where the trajectory is, I mean, that's, that's just an automatic um, a given. But we're not focused on that as much as we're focused on what Sharon is talking about is how do we deliver, you know, whether it's education, whether it's choices, whether it's healthcare, to the individual at the appropriate place, the appropriate time, and in the appropriate you know, amount. And so much of what we're focused on uh, picks up and intersects with Banner or other healthcare providers, but it picks up and it really focuses around you know, what I call the, the social determinants of health. I mean, what, what, what we found out in this pandemic is that the decisions that I make today impact all of you. The decisions you make today impact all of us. And then the decisions that I make today impact myself. And, and so we, we, we were working uh, uh, quite a bit about taking, connecting with our community partners, figuring out with our community stakeholders and, our, and the folks that we serve, 
what is top of mind with them and bring that education or bring that connectivity to them. I got to tell you, the, the, the physician community out here has been phenomenal. They have, uh, every time we've asked them to present information, to talk about uh, different uh, pathways, uh, clinical pathways and that, they've stepped up to the plate. Uh, the uh, other folks have done the same thing. I, so I think we're going to continue to do more and more of that because it's all about how do we give people the education and the tools? And it's not necessarily just the elderly we're focused on, it's all age groups. All age groups are struggling with some of the same issues, whether it's obesity, whether it's mental health. Uh, th this is kind of um, throughout uh, you know, you know, all of the, the, the residents of the West Valley. So we're focused on, 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 on those things, focused on collaborations, focused with our wellness programming to bring um, the tools and the resources to the individual wherever that individual chooses to call home. And whether that's with us on one of our campuses, whether that's somebody in their own individual uh, single family home or somebody in some other kind of congregate setting, we wanna make sure that we can bring those tools and resources to that individual uh, to wherever they choose home. Uh, and, and I think Chris, one of the things we'll get to that, that I see is you know, the biggest impediment that we can talk about is really workforce. Uh, that, that, that is uh, top of mind for all of us. So let's let's go there, Joe. Let's talk workforce. Um, so, you know, I've been in higher education for almost 15 years. I feel like for that entire time, there's been a, a nursing shortage, or at least I feel like somewhere in the country, there's been a nursing shortage. I wasn't always in Arizona. And uh, and now I, I do believe in correct me as you, as you are both experts. I believe that allied health is, is under a workforce crunch as well. A lot of those support roles that do specific things within the the, the healthcare, you know, infrastructure. Um, it, it's difficult to fill enough positions to really meet the demand. Um, so, so how what should we be doing with with workforce development um, it, to to make sure healthcare is sustainable at the levels we want it to be in our, in our community? Yeah, Chris, you know, if I had if I had the, the magic bullet, I, I, I would uh, I'd fire it and say, you know, let's go. And, 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 and I don't I I can just share with you things that we're we're seeing, things that we're doing. Um, I think the workforce transcends healthcare. I think it's across all industries. Uh, if you if you look at some of the statistics out the, on the on the great resignation, I mean, there's uh, millions of people. And we, we've seen a few of some of our experienced folks just have taken a step back and have said, I just need to step back and I'm gonna retire. Although I know that it's, they're probably too early to retire and they probably will come back in, in the future. Uh, we know that there's many people struggling for many different reasons and I, there's no one answer uh, to this. So, so things that we're doing is really looking at all of the different folks that um, uh, we, we're either work for us or that uh, we're recruiting to figure out what is a value to them and seeing if we can't change, you know, whether it's our benefits, whether it's our processes, you know, that's the this whole remote workforce or hybrid workforce, um, you know, like Sharon said, we've accelerated that. We, we all thought about it. And within weeks, we accelerated and implemented those plans. The other thing that we're very proud of, and we work closely with Banner and some other community partners is just really the, 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 the amount of awards that we make around scholarships. Predominantly, it's a lot of healthcare scholarships, nursing scholarships. But this past year in the pandemic, we awarded um, you know, you know, in excess of $400,000 in, in uh, scholarships. And so we're working closely with the high schools, working closely with the community college, West Mech, and, and uh, uh, others to say, how can we be uh, more spot on to, to identify those key groups that we need employees in that is not going to bottleneck the, the healthcare chain. And so uh, we've been, been very successful to attract dollars that we can then turn into scholarship dollars. I got to tell you, just in the last couple months, we've had a few other groups that are awarding scholarships on a small scale that have said, hey, can we come and join your platform? And would that make a bigger impact across the West Valley? I think so. Uh, I, I think back to, um, you know, we learned in the pandemic that the only way through this crisis is we all work together. We all work uh, and, and share information and figure out what are the keys to success. And then we all, we, we, we all work it together. And so we're gonna continue that with workforce development, uh, you know, 
maybe maybe years ago, we would have said, oh, we're going to award scholarships just for Sun Health employees. We don't do that anymore. We award scholarships for anybody that wants to work in certain industry sectors that will help promote the entire growth of the West Valley. And, um, and, and we know that uh, the rising tide will float, you know, all of us and, and all of our boats will all be successful. And if we're not all successful, then we're not living to our ultimate um, uh, maximum that we, we, we could live in this community. Sharon, your, your thoughts on workforce development, uh, you know, nursing, allied health, uh, yeah. just the overall healthcare sector, you know, how do we, how do we make sure that we have the workforce we need as we continue to grow? Yeah, you know, and I think it's, um, you know, for years, uh, there's, you know, the RN shortage has been a discussion in healthcare for years. And, and what's um, amplified that is with the pandemic, they, they've always had options to be in a different setting, um, historically hospital or clinic, and, you know, they, they can work with health plans, um, they can be a case manager, they can be infection prevention, you know, they have many other career pathway, pathways beyond direct bedside or within a clinic. And so that direct patient care, so they can influence care indirectly in, in different types of roles. So what our focus is, and we're doing many of the things that Joe alluded to, but um, really positioning ourselves to say what's important to the future workforce, right? The workforce force of tomorrow is here. And so we've had, we've had folks leave bedside, not just RNs, respiratory therapists, um, many other disciplines that have left bedside, they have left acute care. Um, to Joe's point, they may be retiring, moving on. I, I think retirement means something different today than maybe it did two years ago or, or three years ago, that they're not, they're stepping away from healthcare to do something different. And, you know, as they reevaluate um, their life goals and their aspirations and, you know, their, their family needs. And so that we're attempting to, what is the model of care to be? And with the RNs, the licensed um, physicians, how do we create a team model of care and some of those wraparound resources? So more focus now, Chris, than ever before on um, PCAs and CNAs and um, unit secretaries, what's that team model of support so that nurse can function at top of scope and top of license? How do we free up a team model so the physicians um, can focus on what's best for patients? Um, how do we make documentation a bit easier? How do we leverage those technologies? So a lot of discussion on what's that model of care to be and what does the future workforce need? Um, money's not a motivator. Uh, with our younger workforce, um, money is not their top motivator. And so they want to, it's culture, it's my team. I want to influence the decisions in the organization. I want to know that they care about the community, that they're good stewards, right? And um, how do we influence us with Banner, Banner's mission? How do we make healthcare easier so life can be better? And they want us, they want us to, to live that mission each and every day. So they, and they want to be a part of that. They want to have that purpose and they want to have that connection to the community. So, you know, I, I think the, the shortages um, are going to be for different reasons. And I think our approach needs to change of, you know, what, what does that look like uh, for the future? And so a lot of work is being done on investment in teams, growing our own. Um, we have scholarships and tuition reimbursement and dollars available. We can't give it away fast enough, Chris, quite honestly. Um, we wanna make sure that folks are aware of the programs, grow our own, get them in entry level frontline um, roles and then help them grow within healthcare uh, and, 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 and have that purpose. So it's, it's changing um, as, as we meet the future workforce and that intersects with the changing needs of the community. Um, that's really our focus. Our Banner Health Board is focused on how do we create that sustainable workforce in the future and make sure that we're here to, to serve the needs at every point of access. A lot of conversation around that and what's important to them. And rise above um, compensation is the team, the culture, um, and their ability to influence in that way. So we've talked about change this morning. Go, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Hey, Chris, I, I, um, I think there's an area that we probably should also touch on because I think Banner um, does this very well. And, you know, 
know, we, we support it immensely, but in, 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 we need that engaged workforce, everybody we just described, but in addition to that for healthcare, we need to have just quality physician leadership. And, and that is just paramount. And, and, and when we talk about superior healthcare here in the Northwest Valley or the West Valley, you really gotta have just these uh, world-class physician leaders. We have some here, whether it's in the, you know, the cardi cardiac area, the, the cancer area, uh, uh, the, you know, Banner's recruited these, these physician leaders, but it, it's, it's worked in collaboration, I think, with us and the greater community as Sun Health views itself as kind of the voice of the greater community. We've been supported by the greater community. We have been kind of the, the, the vehicle the communities use to make investments in superior healthcare. So I've been very proud at how we've been working together with Banner to make sure that we're, that Banner is identifying phenomenal uh, world-class physicians, bring them into the community, and then we nurture them with them. Because, you know, physicians want a lot of the same things. They, they want to be, they want to have great, um, you know, tools and, and, and equipment. And we all know that healthcare reimbursement uh, is not the best and that it really doesn't pay for the new innovative things that are coming on the pipeline. They're, they're always paying for uh, uh, what happened or, or bare bones. And, and, and so, so, so I think that combination of Sun Health and Banner Health focused on you know, the physician community and making sure they've got uh, state-of-the-art tools, the, you know, the new technology uh, really serves this community, community very well. So you're talking new technology, right? And I, I, we haven't really talked much about physicians this morning, um, which I think people take for granted that, uh, that, that you know, healthcare is, is so multifaceted in terms of all the different roles that come together, you know, to, to provide the care we receive. Let's, let's talk future. Let's talk 2031, which to me sounds crazy. I'm like, I don't want to think about that. I will have, you know, a junior in high school in my house. I don't want to think about 2031, but uh, 2031, okay, it's 10 years from now. Uh, what's going to be different? And I know change has been accelerated massively during this pandemic, but in the next 10 years, how will we see healthcare differently when we have an ailment or we're, we're receiving maintenance care, um, you know, root, routine care? What, what's going to be different in 10 years um, than what we do today? Yeah, and Joe, I'll be, I'll jump in here uh, and, and just share a lot of focus at Banner Health as we think about the next three, five, 10 years. It is how, how consumers and folks will access us um, across many generations and more home care, home at care models, um, or care at home, excuse me, care at home models, and how we leverage some of our community partners in that space. Um, and that's remote monitoring, it's remote visits. Um, and, and so I, that, that will be part of our future as well as, as we think about, Joe touched on it earlier, social determinants of health. And so as we think about that, um, it is nutrition and wellness and um, chronic disease. How do we really support their wellness and screenings and education? Um, before they're actually sick. And a lot of our focus used to be on major service lines like cardiac, right, and oncology and orthopedics. And that's how we designed our care model around some of those service lines. The future of healthcare is changing because consumers think of it as a disease, right? I may have a heart condition. I may have a lung disease. I may have a GI, GI issues. So the consumer thinks about it in terms of the disease track, right? And so we're changing a lot of our programs with our physicians and our clinicians and our community partners to say, what's a multidisciplinary approach to cancer care? What's a multidisciplinary approach to heart care, right? And um, screenings, diagnostics, um, minimally invasive procedures, robotics, so that it lessens um, their time in the hospital, gets them back to home, back to work, back to school sooner. And so a lot of conversation around what does that mean from a multidisciplinary approach, wraparound services for infants and pediatrics, children, adolescent, adult, and, and our aging population, because their, their needs are very different. So we're having a lot of conversation about how do we change that model uh, around a 
um, you know, oncology center and cardiac center and digestive health center and institute. What does that mean? And it's pulling in various partners. But I think as much as we can um, keep them at home, get them home center recovery, outpatient rehab, outpatient services, because it's very costly once they enter the hospital. Um, and, and that impacts our, our workforce. That impacts some of our local businesses with the workforce uh, that they rely on to be there every day. So um, that, that's some of the work that's underway from our perspective. Well, it sounds like it's a, it's a return to the house call, Sharon. Right. That's that's what doctors used to do is they so, meet yes. you at home. Yeah. And, and concierge medicine is coming back. Uh, my parents in the Midwest um, for the last 10 years had had concierge medicine and their family physician came to the home and it kept my parents um, connected to their health care. It gave them some remote remote connectivity. Um, any monitoring could be done remotely for some of their heart care, chronic conditions. And it kept them out of the hospital um, and, and provided um, opportunities for care at home. We're going to see more of that accelerate uh, in the future. Joe, what do you see different in 2031? You know, Chris, I think it's a continuation of a lot of things that we're already doing, as Sharon talked about. Um, but it, it, I would say it'd be very um, uh, uh, tailored to the individual. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing for a few years, and we've got a lot of discussion on this, is so we work with a physician named Dr. Landry. Uh, his um, uh, uh, company is called Masterpiece Living, and so it's 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 a it's a, a, a program by which you know you've got about five tenants of healthy living, and whether that's you know you know physical you know the physical component, the uh, social component, the vocational component, the spiritual component, but you look at all of those. And then you you choose and get a mixture of that. And so over the past um, you know five to ten years, we've been promoting that, and we've been having folks in our environment, you know, work with that, and then you know log you know their their um, enhancements in those things. And what we're seeing from that is you know those are all great, and if you all, if you live to those within a balance, you know you live a, a longer, richer, healthier, happier life. But even more so now, it's to specifically tweak those components that's purposeful to you, the individual. So while you know I may need a couple doses of social and a bunch of physical, maybe less spiritual, somebody else may need more spiritual and, and vocational. And so it's for people to really think about how to really optimize their life um, and, and then live that life. And, and as we do that, I mean, we've got a number of folks in the one of, uh, one of the uh, 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 individuals we have, her name's Alois. You know, she's late into her, her 90s. She's very active, very social, um, very just a joy to be around. And she'll look and she'll say, you know, I'm so happy that we support, you know, the, the Banner Del Daily Web Medical Center. And I'm so thankful that I've never been there as a patient and I hope to never be there. Well, as long as she keeps living that purposeful life, that right mixture of you know those decisions, she's probably going to live an entire life without ever being a patient in one of our hospitals, which which really you know makes you know makes me just beam with pride because that's what we're trying to do as an organization. So I think over this next decade, we're going to really figure out how we can provide the tools to people so that they can really get in tune with themselves, what is working, what is right. Then when they if they have to engage with a healthcare system, they've got a lot of data they can work with that healthcare provider to say. This is what's working, this is what's right, and then work with that healthcare provider to do a plan that's right with them. And, and we're seeing it with this physician community. They're very open and receptive to that, uh, have a lot of good um, situations where people have got great outcomes because they've had a lot of background information to be able to provide and, and work with the, uh, the physician community. So I, I think that's, I hope in 2030, we can look back and, and everybody's got their own kind of custom tailored approach to their life. And, it, and it's it's and it's healthy for them. Yeah, and I yeah, think a lot of Chris, people are looking forward to that. Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, Chris, I would just add a comment, and Joe, you touched on it. You know, I think from a holistic care perspective, body, mind, spirit. One thing with you know, we need to have conversations around the impact of isolation um, at at every age and across our demographic uh, within folks in our community. There there needs to be a conversation around the impact of physical health. 
and mental health, body, mind, spirit. So I think in the future, more uh, um, a more holistic approach to care and maybe some alternative medicine um, and therapies that um, we hadn't thought of. And, and so I think we're very open. It, we need to be open to that dialogue. Traditional medicine um, may, may be an option, but I think it's, we're, during, we're, we're living in this non-traditional time. And so I think we have to think very innovatively and how do we touch um, on some of the, the social health and well-being? Um, because this, this pandemic has impacted our physical health, our mental health, created a lot of social anxiety for folks to re-engage. And so how do we have conversations around that? We're going to hear more about that. Um, it's my hope that we'll have colonies, these communities of, of um, blue zones, as I call it, but they're, they're healthy communities that focus on nutrition and wellness and, and social connections and uh, really foster the, the uh, increased health of our, our community. And I think the, the you know the pandemic is going to have a, a heavy influence on how people view their own health and, and healthcare and their needs and their wants. Um, I think that goes across all demographic, but especially people in their formative years. If you're younger than 20 and you experience this demographic or this this uh, pardon me, this, this pandemic, that demographic is going to be influenced by this, you know, for for the rest of their lives. Um, similar to a, you know, a war type situation when they come out of it. So um, I, I think you're right, Sharon. I think their desires, what they want to see and experience with healthcare and well-being is going to be different. Uh, let's, let's get one last question and I'll give you a chance for, for closing statements. And, and this is a loaded one, so you don't both have to answer it. <laughs> but public policy, public policy typically trails ridiculously behind what needs to happen. We've had massive change and disruption. You know, Sharon, you just made a great point about just perceptions and, and healthcare areas we haven't focused on. What needs to change in public policy to support these things we want to see uh, in, in healthcare? What, uh, what, what should we be advocating for in the public policy arena? Yeah, Joe, I'll kick off and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt to you. Um, but I, you know, public policy, I think it's our, um, our, our collective, um, connection to the various industries in our community. And there needs to be an open dialogue about what is, how does, how can we leverage public policy to influence many of the things that Joe and I have spoke about this morning. And I think there is a, a couple of barriers um, to that. And I, I think some of it is just folks coming together to have that open dialogue and be very, um, very real to um, the, the current and future realities and how we come up with solutions, policy that can support um, some of the solutions that we have in caring for our communities and um, engaging our businesses and, and making it a place where folks can flourish. And so that, and I think there, the other barrier is the, the cost and you know, who's going to be responsible, right? Who's gonna own certain aspects of those segments and the cost structure around that. And so, you know, where, what are funding resources, any grant opportunities? Um, because there's always a cost of doing one thing over another, whether it's a financial cost or whether it is a, you know, impact to economy, is it impact to family? Um, there's always a cost um, from a, uh, from a uh, human or, or otherwise economic perspective. But I think if we all agree to, you know, what's in the best interest of our communities, education, business, healthcare, some of these cornerstones that really help our communities grow um, and, and, and promotes healthy living, then we all agree of, it, you know, here's what it's going to take an investment to do that. And I, I know those are some of the barriers we need to knock down, my opinion. Joe, public policy, specific things that, that we need to be thinking about. Yeah, so Chris, I every time I answer this question, I always get in trouble, right? So I'm, I'm going to try to be a little more politically correct. So I, I first off, I would just say that um, you know, being um, uh, uh, involved and kind of a student of uh, the American system my whole life, I, I greatly believe in you know our public debate. I greatly believe in in our our government and the way that we you know, raise issues, debate issues, and all those things. I, I I would not change any of that. 
I think when I think back over the last, you know, as I think back over the last 20 months and some of the issues that we uh, ran up against, and if I could have had a whiteboard and, and would ch change something, it would be things, a couple things. One is uh, to make sure that all of the regulatory agencies that we fall under, if they would collaborate as closely together as we collaborated as an industry group. Uh, it was amazing to me how, as an industry group, we would collaborate, uh, share with what's working, what's not, how, how things have to change. But then constantly when we uh, got back with our, our regulatory environments, we had conflicting um, uh, pronouncements, guidance, uh, regulations. And so we spent a lot of energy uh, amongst the staff just trying to sort that out. And, and many times it was just different agencies hadn't um, collaborated with other agencies before they issued their pronouncements. And so I, it'd be nice if um, this collaborative effort that we, we, we survived under in, the, uh, in our sector uh, basically really gets um, infused in the, uh, in the regulatory body. And that might be wishful thinking. The, the other thing that I would hope for is, is when we have debate and constructive debate around this public policy, let's really you know, keep it factual and, you know, dial into um, the facts and not, not um, uh, divert, because because that was the other thing is, you know, we had a, a care team, some, some medical professionals, our infectious disease team that were looking at stuff and providing us guidance on an ongoing basis. But then somebody come along and say, well, there's, a, there's an article out that says X. And so what we're going to do is going to be more harm. And then we'd have to spend time to research the article, look at the science behind it, and then have the team say, well, there's no science behind it. And so we're still going to do this. So it, it, I, on, a, on a public policy debate, I just would hope that um, we could just come together and have that uh, debate in a way that we're not trying to push and it, one agenda over the other, because we're really talking about our lives, our lives as individuals and what's healthiest for us. And, and, and while there be some differences, you know, we already talked about some, some of the social determinants of health differences and, and, and you know, wide guardrails, there's, 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 you know, there's, the science is, is pretty proven on, on what to do and how to do it. So, so I would hope we could get there. Um, you, you know, I, I think the thing that's been very disruptive um, is that just, you know, for, for a while we're headed down a value-based proposition, and then we're going to go back to a fee-for-service proposition, back to value-based. We've we've got to we got to choose a path and a path that makes sense and stay on it because you know we make investments for 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 the next ten you know decade or more when we when we use the community's dollars to make investments, uh, and those investments need to be predicated upon a stable system that's going to be in place during the term of that investment, not that it changes every every couple of years when when um, a select group of politicians, you know, come and go in the, you know, in political office. Well, I appreciate uh, both your time. I will give you 30 seconds for any final thoughts, Joe. You know, I, I, I would just say that, it, as you can tell, I'm very appreciative for all the, the community support, the, the collaborative efforts. One thing that we didn't touch on, I'll just mention briefly is, is, uh, you know, Sharon Lynn and her team and, and Sun Health, you know, during this pandemic, we, we transformed the Boswell, the, the Banner Boswell Medical Campus. I think that if that transformation would not have been ongoing during this pandemic, it could have had a, even a, a, a bigger impact on the community, probably more negative impact because they were able to pivot through that transformation, take in the consideration of the pandemic, how to, how to have patient flow in a pandemic while um, uh, there was construction ongoing. And, and I think the community uh, was served very well by that. So I think we have evidence um, over and over again of great collaboration of, of, of leaders coming together, doing what's best for you know, the community and, and hold that up uh, as the, the, the goal, not what's best for the individual organization. And if we keep working together like that, um, I, I feel pretty confident there's really nothing the world's gonna throw at us that we can't figure out and, and, and accomplish and, and continue on. So I want to appreciate um, you know, the Surprise Chamber and their involvement to be uh, that connector. Uh, it's, it's all of us um, working together. It's, it's going to make this uh, a great place to live, work, and, and, and play. Well, it's great you, to Chris. hear. Thank you. Sharon, you get the last word. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Joe. 
I appreciate uh, the chamber organizing this uh, conversation today. And you know, I, as as part of the chamber uh, member and sitting on the board, you know, the the I, I I think our mission and vision is right, and it's the right work. And I appreciate the opportunity to be that valued business partner, and any opportunity we have to come together with a collective on you know how do we focus on um, healthier communities. Uh, we want to be at the table and and. And I appreciate the diversity um, in some of those strategic partnerships because I think that is important. Um, there, you know, there needs to be some debate uh, around that um, of how we can influence. But I think we're ultimately better together. And we, if, if as long as we have that common vision of this is what we're aiming for, um, there is great potential here to influence that uh, with the growth in the in the Northwest Valley and continued growth with some of these partnerships. So thank you for the opportunity today uh, to share uh, some of what's happening within our healthcare space. And uh, I look forward to our future work together. Uh, so thank you to the chamber and thank you, Chris. Thank you both. And Raul, I believe uh, we are good to wrap up there. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you, Joe and Sharon. Awesome uh, program today. And also uh, thank you, Chris, for, for, mo for moderating today. Uh, if you like our convener topics, uh, you know, I'd like to encourage everybody to go to our website for future programs and networking opportunities. And please remember to like and share our posts uh, and our videos. So with that, again, uh, thank you very much for attending uh, today's convener event. Thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you.